Hello and welcome to everyone who's joining us today for our new access uh, assurance overview of our new NAC uh, from Miss Juniper. Um, why don't we start off with Michael? What is NAC? What is a NAC? You don't want me to say hello? I'll just start out with what is NAC? I, I can yeah. do that. I can do that. Sure. So, hey everybody. So NAC, Network uh, Access, is really what this is all about. Um, you know, if we go back in time, it was how do I authenticate, authorize people on the network and allow them to have the resources, what, what they're supposed to have, as opposed to the way it used to be done in my day, which is you plug in and connect to everything and had access to whatever it is that you wanted to have. So network uh, access control is a way of, of being able to control users. What do you think of that? I think that's a pretty broad statement. I think if we wanted to nail it down to some concepts, I think we could start off authorization, you know, the AAA server that really started it all off, client profiling, posture compliance, zero trust network access, and then client onboarding. I think those five pillars kind of make up what NAC is. Um, and it really determines how each individual, uh, whether it be the IT specialist, or maybe it's an entire group of NAC specialists that do this. So. Why don't we start off with the history of NAC? You know, it's a broad concept, but how do we get here? Well, you know, that, that is a great question, Rollo, and I'm glad that you asked me that question. Uh, let's start around like the 2000 time frame. You know, prior to that, it was people just connected to the network and had access to whatever on the network. And people started to take security a little bit more seriously. And this is where you had Cisco come up with their, their NAC product. That, yes. That's right. Exactly. Back when people actually had to use a modem, stick it in there, and be able to actually access the internet. Wow, you remember modems. That's great. I'm so well, happy by that. You know what? I am a kid that grew up during those times, so I had to learn this somehow. But I mean, you also got the experience of probably in 2007, that's when, you know, the iPhone really started to boom and kind of change how we did, you know, architecture, you know, from NAC profiling, NAC guests. Um, I'm pretty sure that's when AmigoPod came out and yeah. now Venda. You know, those are the two products that Aruba purchased in order to make ClearPass. And uh, during that time frame of BYOD in like 2010s is when everyone started bringing their iPods, their iPads, and they wanted to connect to the internet. This is where Cisco ISE ICE came out. And that's kind of where we've kind of transitioned to in the 2010s to the 2012s. Um, do you want to talk about like Okta and Azure when they came into play? Wait, you can just keep going, dude. You're doing such a great job right now. Uh, you're on a roll. But I, I, before you don't continue, because you're right, with BOID, you know, I remember like in 2010 when that started to become a thing that, hey, we needed to support devices that were no longer corporate assets. And how do we control these people? Because we don't know what's on those devices. So we got to make sure that, A, they can connect because the new generation wanted to bring those things into work and have access to the network. So yeah, so that then of course with the advent of the cloud, because really, even though 2007, it was, I remember like 2010 when the cloud, that word became more popular and people started talking about it more and it was like, well, oh, the cloud's never really gonna take off. Well, here we are today, right? So yeah, so, you know, we have lots of different cloud offerings there's that you can take advantage of and to be able to provide NAC services to customers. Like Okta at Azure, you know, back in, I would say probably 2012, 2013, that's when the cloud ID as a service kind of came into front. Um, and then, you know, the evolution, the next step forward that we're seeing even today is IoT, right? Uh, the Internet of Things. And as we are bringing more things into the workplace, whether it be our watches like I'm wearing right now, or other devices, it's growing as we go. And the evolution has, you know, surpassed that monolithic style code that we've talked about before yeah right? well that's right so you've heard me talk about architecture and you're right it's the, the the thing with the way that networks have grown over the last 30 40 years it's just more boxes more software and it becomes extremely complex and you know the really the only reason my opinion that people it's like oh well we have to get rid of that old server and get a new server is because the operating systems become so big with bloatware and everything else it just keeps getting bigger and bigger because we want to add more functionality so you end up with a something that's complex something that's rigid and that doesn't really fit into the model that we're using today it's all about devops it's how do i 
do things quickly? How do, how do I make changes without having to take six months or a year to do that? So that's really where we are today. Yeah, you're right. It's We're built on this monolithic code where we have one server, maybe one VM, maybe even a cluster that we have to build out. And the problem with NAC nowadays is it's not really based on the company, the vendor that you choose. It's more about how are you going to do this? How are you going to build out the NAC and self, the load balancing from the servers, whatever you choose to do? You know, what happens when you have to add uh, a new feature, a new component on top of all the different services that are already ingrated, integrated onto that machine, right? Whether it is a guest portal, maybe it's the policy engine, maybe it's the posture check. Whatever it is, when you have to update that feature, you're going to have to take that component down. And what happens when you take it down? When are you going to do it? How are you going to do it? When is this update going to be happening that my functionality may be to come, you know, affecting you? And this is affects the users and the admins all in one. Right. And, and really what this comes down to is that, you know, these vendors sell these products. But just like network, like I buy all hubs and no, no longer hubs, switches and routers and access points. It's network architects and security architects who are responsible for designing it and then deploying it and then the ops people being able to manage that NAC is exactly the same way it's like you said all these pieces of monolithic code that all gets put together on top of this complex network and it's the customer who's ultimately responsible for it, the design and the maintenance and the security aspect that goes along with that and you add things on like business continuity, disaster recovery on top of that for your NAC solution because it says it's as critical as everything else because without it, you're not going to get access to your network. So you're 100% correct. Complexity, brittle, and the way it is observed, it was designed to be on-prem. And nowadays with everything going on, all this is now into the cloud. So all those on-premise directors and stuff through the legacy LDAP, you know, lack of agility and scale, maintenance and all this kind of stuff has brought this issue upon those NAC solutions. This is why you're seeing stuff like Mist, Juniper coming out with these new NAC solutions because we see that there is a possibility of evolving what we've already seen throughout the existence of it and we're going forward. So Michael, why don't we talk about what we're doing? What is Juniper doing as a NAC move forward into this evolution? Yeah, because that, that's a great segue and I'm Let's just talk about Mist for a second and getting into that because, you know, Mist really changed the way we look at networks, how we manage networks, how we deploy networks and all that kind of stuff. And people say, oh, it's in the cloud, but not all cloud deployments are equal. Just the, by the fact that I've got something in the cloud doesn't necessarily make it the same as everybody else. And what Mist did was that they, they went to a microservices architecture. They built it on Kafka. It becomes very resilient and the ability to add features at you know at, at speeds that we've never seen before that's what they decided to do with the NAC solution which is take away the complexity of how do i design it how do i deploy it and how do i manage it so it's it's very similar in nature is that it's built on microservices it's in the cloud but you don't you don't have to manage the cloud what you're really doing is what you really want which is I want to control the users without having all that complexity that you're used to doing today. And that's what we bring to the table is that it is NAC in the cloud with the ability to configure it and your users could be anywhere on your network and they will have the same service that they have in the office that they do at their home or even when they're out roaming about at Tim Hortons, you say that, uh, or some local coffee shop. How's that? Um, getting access to the things that they need to have access to and, and not being able to get to the things that they're not supposed to get to. So to me, that that's, I could say it in like two minutes, that's what makes us different is that we've taken the missed approach to NAC in making it microservices and, and resilient. What do you think? Yeah, so I'll just go a little more fine on detail. So one of the things that we do very well is the fact that we have a mono, uh, the microservices cloud that you mentioned. And what we've done is we've taken that same approach that we do with MIST and put it into a authentication portal. And we've made this MIST authentication cloud server where we can do micro services like we talked about, where we can be able to update bi-weekly and to what is necessarily, right? 
What really we're doing is we're identifying who, what, user, device ID, the security posture, where is it, the location of it, right? We're identifying it right away. We're gonna assign a policy from the network user to the device belongs to, and then through that, we're gonna do identification. Identifying segmentation for VLAN, GP, uh, GBP tag, as well as the role that it will play. And from that, we're gonna do a security validation from it, from the end user's connectivity across the whole stack, from our SRXs all the way up to our EXs. And then we're gonna be able to figure out, is the user able to connect? If not, why? Which policy is gonna be applied to that specific user and device? After authentication, how is the user doing? Is the experience good? You know, Marvis is gonna anomaly detect and conservatively interface with the troubleshooting. So whether it be at the beginning of the phase when they're just trying to log in to the end user experience, we're making sure that entire life cycle is done well together and making sure that everyone is enjoying their time on the network. Yeah, getting access to the things that they need to have access to. Absolutely. It is, uh, it is a completely different approach. Um, one thing that we might want to say is, um, if you've seen that the ar our architecture slides is that we have our MIST cloud uh, and it is based on APIs. We have our NAC cloud, which is, it's a little bit different in that it is everywhere. So we're, we're not really tied to, you know, one specific place. But the fact that we've also integrated into third party identity, you know, um, authorization or sorry, identity users type of thing, uh, right out of the gate makes it extremely flexible. You know, so whatever you're using today, like you said, Okta or Azure or something like that, you still get to use it today. That part doesn't change. Did you've seen the videos on, on how they set it up us compared to everybody else. It really kind of blew me away how how easy it is to deploy this solution compared to other solutions that I've seen out there where, you know, it's built by engineers for engineers and only engineers will ever be able to use it. Almost to the point where you have to understand maybe Boolean algebra in order to do this. Now it's like, like you said, group-based policies and this user can access this, we'll have these tags assigned to them in these VLANs and away they go. And it's just, it was night and day uh, as far as I'm concerned, between what we're doing and everybody else in the industry is doing. Yeah, and I wanted to keep touching on, I want to go through the architecture a little bit more because we do have different POPs locations from all around the globe, from east and west of the United States, and then also all the way globally. So you can do it not just, you know, one location, but you can set up different sites. Um, the MIST authentication cloud server is set up differently from the MIST cloud. So it is sending telemetry back and forth. It'll be collecting that meta, uh, the metadata that you'll be respecting. And then also it'll be responsible for enforcing the policy, doing the user's authentication, uh, keeping the session states, um, the data of all the endpoints records, all that stuff back to the MIST cloud. So it is a one type of architect architecture from both sides. Whether it is from the MIST AP or if it's done through a third-party TLS encrypted uh, RADSEC tunnel using our MIST Edge, we can still be able to connect to that third party, like you were talking about Azure ID or whatever other you know provider they are using. We can be able to connect to that, so that's our open architecture still going at it. And we're also doing a lot of the heavy lifting. We're doing a lot of the metadata between information and being sent back to back to be able to manage it better. And like I just said, you, you just said it in itself, third-party infrastructure, whether it is a Cisco switch, an Aruba cloud, a controller, we can integrate with that with our uh, MIST Edge platform. That's right, yeah. It doesn't have to be solely, you know, monolithic vendor type of deployment. We work with different vendors, whether it's through identity or whether it's network infrastructure. We have the ability to do it all. And, and so that, while you were talking there, this is the thing that came back in, into my head as we've been going through these videos is that, you know, customers, you know, we've been building networks for a long time and we've always taken what has been given to us. It's like, here's a brand new switch, here's a brand new server, here's a brand new whatever with more complex code and everything else. Never really in the history of, of our industry until Mist came along and, and merged in with, with Juniper, we could actually say, you have a choice. You should be demanding more from your network vendors. You should be demanding more on how your network works because, you know, they don't really care about the fact that, hey, I, I'm buying a router. They want the router to route. They want the switch to switch. They just want it to work. 
without having to have really, you know, uh, high skill set people. Not to say anything bad about them, but I just want it to work. So you should be demanding more. And to me, this delivers on that. We're delivering on that, demanding more. You should expect more from your network. Could have said better myself. <laughs> so, for those who are interested, there are links out there that we will provide for you to do your own understanding and going through our own material. There is a MIST uh, Academy that has the updated um, going through this presentation in a little bit more detail. Um, there is also optional uh, videos out there that show you how to do uh, MIST Access Assurance versus ClearPath and even ICE. So you can see what we're talking about. We're not going to just give you guys false hope. There's videos out there to show you how quickly we can provision someone's uh, access pretty quickly. Uh, I think what I remember was, I think ICE was about 15 minutes, Aruba Clear Pass was about 12 to 13 minutes, and we did ours in about eight to seven minutes, just making sure as long as you have the information beforehand from like your um, certification and making sure you have your identity, identity provider information. As long as you have that beforehand, we can do it pretty quickly. And the best ability about it is that we do scale and uh, adjust to what you're needed. So do you have anything else you wanted to bring up, Michael? No, I, 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 dude, I think we've, we've hammered this home. But I think, uh, I think we've, we've uh, really made our point. Listen, man, if you're, if you're looking at NAC, this is the thing you should be looking at as far as I'm concerned. This is the same level that, you know, when NIST came along, how they changed things. And then how 128T came along and... You know, our SD-WAN component, how that's changed. This is that next level of, you know, magic that's happening. That's, that's really changing things. And to me, the really cool part is that this is phase zero of what we're doing with that. And over the next coming months and years, as we start to add in new features and new capabilities, I can't even imagine where this is actually going to go, other than it's going to be a really cool ride to get there. 100%. Well, I want to thank Ingram for allowing us to be on here and be able to talk about how you can demand more from your Juniper networks alongside MIST. Um, I appreciate you all's time joining us. And Michael, any last words? No, man. I th I had a great time uh, doing this with you. So I want to uh, say that right up front and want to thank Ingram for allowing us to get on camera and, and doing the stupid stuff that we do sometimes. So that's uh, appreciate that as well. And I appreciate everybody uh, for coming and listening to us uh, talk to each other.